in the slide here as well. Um, we will be recording this lecture, but turn off the recording for the question and answer session. And please ensure your microphone is muted and your video is off to help conserve bandwidth for all participants. And uh, use the Zoom chat if you have any technical issues. Um, please write any questions that you might have during the roughly 40 minute talk in the chat box of Zoom. And after the presentation, we will have um, about 20 minutes for Q&A. And you will be able to sort of raise your hand with a blue hand icon. And once called on, please turn on um, your video and microphone mm -hmm. to ask your question. And once your question has been answered, please turn off your video and uh, the sort of raise your hand icon. And we will wrap up the discussion at uh, 1.30 p.m. UK time. So thanks very much for joining us today and a very warm welcome to our Michaelmas term Oxford Water Network seminar series on water society and policy. My name is Johanna Köhler. I'm Assistant Professor of Environmental Policy and Governance at the Environmental Studies Institute Freie Universität Amsterdam and Honorary Research Associate at the University of Oxford. Uh, to the next slide, please. Um, it is my great pleasure that our guest speaker today is Professor Albert Mumma. He is an environmental lawyer with over 30 years experience, both in the academic field and in the practice of law. He is professor of law at the University of Nairobi and holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge, where he wrote a doctoral thesis on water law. His expertise includes legal and policy arrangements relating to institutional developments and uh, environmental natural resources law. And Professor Mumma has worked professionally at national, regional and international levels. His experience includes assignments in the UK, in Eastern and Southern African countries, in the Horn of Africa, as well as in Uganda and Zambia specifically. He provided comments for Kenya's constitution of 2010, and he is one of the main architects of the 2016 Water Act. He also advised on several county water laws and policies in Kenya, including in Laikipia, Kitui and Kuali counties. And currently he's involved in the finalization of the water services regulations under the Water Act, which will be presented in a parliamentary meeting next week. So I'm very excited that he's able to join us today as since our first meeting in Kenya, I think it was in 2013, he has uh, provided unique insights into the Kenyan devolution process, not just from a legal analysis point of view, but being in the midst of the political challenges of devising and changing institutions in a complex governance system. So I'm very happy that today he will share these insights with all of us. Over to you, Professor Muman. Uh, thank you, thank you, Joanna. Uh, I'm uh, happy to have this opportunity to speak on this topic. Uh, you know, the topic for today's uh, discussion is uh, providing water services in a devolved governance structure. And we are using uh, the Kenya case uh, really to, to illustrate devolution generally. Uh, and as I think, uh, you know, uh, listeners will be aware, devolution is a troubling subject uh, in very many African countries. And so I think it is, uh, you know, quite important to, to try and look at it, particularly through the prism, in this case, of the provision of water services. I'd like to uh, start uh, this conversation essentially by giving you a bit of uh, context uh, relating to the constitutional framework uh, in Kenya. Uh, and so if we could look at the next uh, slide, uh, I, I discussed there uh, the constitutional framework uh, in Kenya, uh, and the background is that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Kenya ushered in a new constitution, uh, which was in 2010, and uh, this constitution brought in two uh, levels of government, uh, the national government and uh, county governments, and county governments specifically are 47 in number, uh, and uh, to each level of government, uh, functions were allocated, and this uh, allocation of functions is uh, addressed in the fourth schedule uh, of the Constitution of Kenya. Now, uh, specifically on the water sector, 
And the use of water resources uh, is uh, a function of the national government, uh, whereas water and sanitation services is a function of county uh, governments. So as you can see there, uh, there is a, a distinction uh, between, on the one hand, responsibility and uh, you know, uh, functions related to water resources and the provision of water services. But then the, the fourth schedule uh, doesn't uh, address a number of uh, pertinent issues related to water supply. Uh, so by way of example, uh, there's no provision uh, made uh, on cross-county uh, water supply. Uh, there's no provision on uh, bulk water supply. There's no provision on the regulation of water services. And I think uh, as, as you will see, these are uh, obviously quite important uh, issues. But at the same time, uh, the constitution uh, provides, if we go on to the next slide, that uh, both national and county governments may charge for the services they provide. Uh, and uh, it also provides that consumer protection uh, is a mandate uh, of the national government, and that would be consumer protection, for instance, in the area uh, of water services provision. And then uh, a third important point is uh, provision uh, dealing with cooperation between uh, national and county governments and cooperation among the county governments uh, themselves. And this is provided for uh, in an article that uh, basically states that uh, governments at uh, each level may cooperate and they may cooperate by setting up, among others, uh, joint authorities. There are other important provisions uh, in the constitution which are relevant to this question of devolution. Uh, including the fact that uh, only the national government may impose taxes, uh, with the exception of property taxes and entertainment taxes. Uh, and uh, whereas county governments uh, may borrow, uh, you know, the borrowing by county governments must be guaranteed uh, by the national government. Uh, the constitution then uh, proceeds to say that revenue which is raised nationally shall be shared equally among national and county governments. Uh, but traditionally, county governments may be given additional allocations, which may be given either unconditionally or subject to conditions. Now, those provisions, uh, as you can see, in some ways give you the broad framework in the context of which uh, devolution uh, in Kenya uh, you know, is then to be implemented. Uh, in light of the fact that uh, you know, there are areas uh, of the constitution which require uh, you know, uh, to be nuanced and supplemented and fleshed out, in the uh, area of water uh, specifically, the Water Act of 2016 uh, was enacted to give effect to the constitutional provisions. Now, in the next slide, we then deal with the Water Act uh, provisions. Uh, this came into effect in 2016. Uh, its aims uh, include to align the water sector uh, to the constitution of 2010 and uh, additionally to fill in gaps and reduce ambiguities. Uh, as I've indicated, you can see that there are a couple of uh, ambiguities that in fact are quite uh, you know, uh, pertinent to this particular discussion. The act then uh, requires county governments to establish county water services providers as a means to providing water services. And uh, the reason is that essentially uh, county governments who are the uh, mandated entity to provide water services could in fact provide water services either directly or through uh, uh, you know, uh, other means. And uh, in terms of the requirements of the Water Act, this is to be provided through uh, county water service providers established by the counties. Now, the reason uh, for requiring county governments to establish water services providers is basically to ring fence uh, the provision of water, so the revenue from water services. Uh, you know, under the constitutional framework and uh, in terms of the Public Finance Management Act, county governments are required to establish a county revenue authority into the county revenue authority, uh, revenues received by the county government uh, are to be placed and the expenses of the county government are to be met out of the county revenue authority. Uh, as uh, in, in, in that uh, respect, 
if revenues were received by county government from water services, they would go into the county revenue authority. And once in there, there is no way of, of, of earmarking or influencing revenues because it's a general fund. Uh, for this reason, uh, the Act of 2016 has required water, uh, has required county governments to establish an autonomous, a semi-autonomous entity, a water services provider, so that the revenues can be reinvested within that water services provider. Another important, uh, you know, uh, provision in the Water Act of 2016 is the establishment of a national regulator, and that's the Water Services Regulatory Board. The Water Services Regulatory Board is then mandated uh, to essentially uh, license uh, water service providers as a regulatory tool and uh, to approve tariffs, set standards, and you know, perform many other functions that are related to consumer protection. Now, because this is a national function, consumer protection, then the, the national regulatory uh, entity is then mandated to discharge that particular function. Uh, the Act uh, also makes provision for cross-county uh, you know, water services provision, uh, which, as, as you recall, we had indicated is not expressly addressed in the Constitution. Uh, the Act does so by providing uh, for the establishment of agencies known as the Waterworks Development Agencies. Now, those Waterworks Development Agencies are mandated to provide water services in bulk uh, particularly in instances where the water services, the bulk water services are cross county uh, in nature. Uh, and, uh, you know, the waterworks development agencies may develop the bulk water services infrastructure, but in a situation where a joint authority has been established by county governments, then it would uh, transfer the waterworks to the uh, joint authority that has been established. The Act also establishes a, a regulatory entity for water resources, uh, which is the Water Resources Authority. If we move on to the next page, you'll then see a depiction, a pictorial depiction of this institutional framework, uh, you know, in the water sector. And as you can see there, uh, basically what the, uh, uh, the Water Act uh, institutional framework has provided is for entities that are uh, operating at national level, at regional level, and at local level. Of interest to this discussion, you will see there that there is provision for water services regulatory board, and that water services regulatory board is a regulator at national level. There is also provision for water works development agencies at regional level, because these will operate at regional rather than at county level, for the reason that they deal with cross county bulk water services provision. And then uh, at county level, at local level, there is uh, provision for water services providers. Now on the opposite side, Professor Muma, it's, the video has just stalled. I do hope it can come back. If not, maybe if you could turn your video off and I will turn mine off as well, just to allow for my bandwidth. Yes, I think we can see your video moving again. Can you hear, you're on mute right now, can you? Could we move on to the next uh, slide, please? Uh, okay. Yeah, now, so given that uh, institutional framework with the mandates that have been, uh, you know, provided for in the Water Act of 2016, one would think that, uh, you know, uh, the constitutional reforms relating to devolution have been addressed, but there are still, uh, you know, big policy questions 
that remain unresolved. And, and so what I would like to do at this stage is to discuss a few of these unresolved issues so that you can see uh, some of the issues that must be addressed if devolution uh, in the water services subsector, uh, you know, essentially are to, to be uh, completed. So by way of example, uh, notwithstanding what the Water Act provides is that uh, there will be a transfer uh, of existing assets, liabilities and staff from the national government to county governments. Now, this is across the board. Uh, whereas uh, we are looking specifically at the water sector, the issue uh, of transfer of assets, liabilities and functions affects all the other sectors. And basically, uh, you know, provision was made for this particular issue. But more, more interesting is the fact that there is still a lack of clarity regarding financial responsibility for meeting the capital costs of future infrastructure development. Uh, what the, the Constitution and the Act provides for is that essentially the functions, uh, say of water services provision are a county government function, but when you have infrastructure development, particularly major infrastructure development, then it is quite clear that in many cases, the county governments will not have the capacity to meet these out of their own resources. And it may be necessary either to borrow uh, money, particularly from development partners, or in some situations where you're dealing with cross-county infrastructure, there is a lack of clarity as to you know, the, who should be the borrowing entity, with the result that the borrowing entity in those situations remains the national treasury at national level. Uh, thirdly, uh, is the question of uh, the taking over of uh, joint, uh, of taking over of assets by joint authorities. Uh, there is still no clear policy direction on whether along with taking over the assets, uh, you know, the county government uh, or the joint, you know, the county governments must also take over the liabilities for water services provision. I mean, I think it is, uh, you know, it is, it is not surprising that, uh, you know, county governments would love to be able to take over assets, but to leave the liabilities to be addressed, to be dealt with by the national government. Uh, and therefore this question remains a matter of uh, continuing uh, debate. Uh, basically, because the taxpayer uh, is essentially responsible for the liabilities that the national treasury uh, has to pay, there is a question of equity, which is that if you are dealing with a system that is now devolved and you're dealing with functions that are devolved, then uh, logic would dictate that the, the financial responsibility for paying for loans uh, that are, are associated with the water supply should be with the county that is uh, benefiting from that water services rather than with the general taxpayer. But at the same time, uh, you know, affordability, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, for paying this uh, large infrastructure development remains uh, a problematic case. Uh, and, and because of that, the, there is a question mark about whether tariffs can be increased to such a level that they are able to repay these loans, both inherited and future, but at the same time do not undermine, at the same time do not undermine the, the right which is in the constitution of universal access to water. Because if water becomes afford unaffordable, then it would be pretty uh, you know, uh, difficult to argue that the country is moving in the direction of universal, universal access to water. I'd just like them to now address the, uh, you know, the issue of um, cross-county bulk water uh, services in a little more detail, uh, because this is uh, clearly one question that remains uh, problematic uh, in uh, implementing the evolutionary framework that is given. And so if we look at the next slide, you will see uh, at the next slide that you have there uh, a map which gives you uh, the drainage areas uh, in Kenya. Largely, uh, there are, you know, uh, I mean, you, you can see the drainage areas in Kenya. Largely, there are six drainage areas, uh, but, you know, the middle part has uh, some sub basins, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, give you the impression that there are many more, but, you know, uh, ordinarily, uh, these drainage areas are six. 
Uh, and if you look at these drainage areas, you will see from the little uh, rivulets that uh, are shown on the map that, uh, you know, most of the water resources in the country are in the south uh, west and in the central part uh, of the country. Okay, that's where the bulk of the water resources are. The, the, the northern part, which is northwest, north, uh, you know, the, the central part, uh, north central and northeast, going down to the, the coastal region, are generally arid and semi arid. Uh, in fact, the position in Kenya is that two thirds of the landmass uh, is semi arid, one third of the landmass, uh, you know, has adequate water resources. Uh, on the bottom left, you will see there uh, Lake Victoria, uh, which uh, basically means that that particular part of the country uh, has uh, actually the second largest freshwater lake uh, in the world. But, uh, you know, uh, much of the, the uh, rest of the country uh, actually has hardly any uh, significant water resources to speak of. So if, if we move on to the next slide, you will then uh, see uh, on this particular slide, uh, you know, a, a depiction of the, uh, what we are calling demand uh, clusters. Now, demand clusters here uh, speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the country has not only an uneven distribution of water resources, but uh, at the same time, the country also has you know, a fairly uneven distribution of concentrations of population and uh, economic activity, which are the drivers, the, the primary drivers of, of demand uh, for uh, water services. And so if you look at this, then uh, essentially, uh, you know, the demand clusters align themselves very much to the areas in which, uh, as we indicated, there are water resources. Uh, so by way of example, uh, if you look at the central part of the country, uh, you'll see that's a major demand cluster. And uh, if you look at the western part of the country, uh, there is a major demand cluster uh, at that point. And, you know, uh, a lot to the north because of the scarcity of population, uh, there is a rather limited uh, demand there. Uh, and basically, if you also look at the many dots there, they depict the cities. And those cities, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, are um, attractions uh, of, of water uh, services. So, you know, a lot of the demand revolves around those cities. And you can see that, you know, they tend on the whole to cluster uh, in, in the western part, in the central part. Uh, a bit on the coastal region to the south, but uh, not much uh, in the north. I'd like to juxtapose that uh, with the supply clusters. And so if you look at the next map, what you will see is uh, an indication uh, of, you know, where the water resources that go to meet that demand uh, is located. Uh, and so here, I, I'd like you just to pick up two points. One is, is the fact that this particular map is superimposed uh, on, on uh, the, the map of counties, showing the county boundaries. So the, the inner layer, or those maps you will see, are county boundaries. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the map uh, that shows you the county boundaries, you will then see a second, uh, you know, um, some dotted lines which are, are green in color. And if you look at those, you will then see the direction uh, of uh, movement of water resources from where the water resources is, uh, is obtained to where it is moving. So it's a supply uh, you know, indicator. And in all cases, you will see that the major arrows cross a number of county boundaries. Okay, So if you look at the green arrows, you'll see that they cross a number of county boundaries which basically is intended to indicate that for meeting the demand in uh, these major uh, town centers, you have to get water from outside of the county boundaries. That is the uh, important thing. You have to get water from outside of the county boundaries. And, and in some cases, from, for quite a long distance. So if, I, if you look at cluster number three, for example, uh, 
you will see the arrows moving all the way, right from the central highlands all the way to the coastal region. So you have to cross several county boundaries in order to take that water to where it is needed. And this essentially uh, gives you the case for why this question of cross county bulk water supply is such a critical case in Kenya. Uh, it, it applies to all the major urban centers. Nairobi is dependent on water from outside uh, of Nairobi, in fact, two counties away. Mombasa is dependent on water services from a neighboring county, you know, neighboring counties, uh, you know, um, in, in, in the coastal region, but outside of Mombasa. If you look at the West, uh, you know, Eldoret and Najam, another major urban center is dependent on water resources from outside. So this is the case for almost all of Kenya's uh, major urban centers that they are dependent on cross county, uh, you know, uh, water supply. And that leads us then uh, to the next issue, which is that the, the, the uh, we look at the next slide, which is basically uh, making the case that it is not enough uh, that the constitution uh, provides that water services is a county function. Left on their own, the counties would not have internally the water resources to enable them to discharge that particular function. Counties have to look outside of county borders in order to, to be able to obtain the water that they would need. Now, there isn't an institutional framework that uh, caters to the need by counties to draw in water services, to, you know, to draw in water resources from outside of the county. And therefore, uh, we then need to look at this uh, entity that is called uh, joint authorities. Now, I, I, I have indicated here that, uh, you know, joint authorities is, is really Kenya's uh, ligers. And uh, what I, I, I can tell you by way of um, context is, you know, when I was studying uh, in the 90s, there was much fascination uh, with a new creature uh, called a liger. Uh, at that time, it was said that uh, this creature called a liger had been born in China. And so there was a lot of fascination. Would it survive? What was its genetic makeup? What was this liger? Uh, essentially, a liger is a hybrid uh, born of uh, you know, a lion and a tiger. Uh, and so it's, it's a new creature. And, and you know, thinking about that sort of hybrid and, and, uh, and thinking about joint authorities, I find a lot of um, you know, similarity with this particular issue. Of joint authorities because joint authorities are an unknown entity. Uh, what Kenyans uh, know and what I think is known in, in many other countries are governmental entities that are either governmental entities owned by the national government or governmental entities owned by local authorities. Now in the international arena obviously there is plenty of precedent for intergovernmental uh, authorities. And these intergovernmental entities tend to be established pursuant to a bilateral or multilateral treaty. Now, there is little precedent for an intergovernmental entity within a county and within a national government and county setting. Uh, it is not common uh, for national governments and entities with, you know, within uh, the same country to get into you know, uh, some sort of intergovernmental treaty in order to establish uh, you know, uh, this uh, cooperation of this particular kind. And yet that is what we are faced with uh, in Kenya. And so you might think about how would a joint authority be brought into existence? Uh, and you, know, you could bring a joint authority into existence by having uh, you know, uh, an inter-county agreement or an agreement between uh, and on the one hand, a number of counties and the national governments on the other hand. Uh, and that would be similar to the way you might do this at international level, some sort of you know, inter-government uh, agreement. You, you might also bring this about essentially by allowing those county governments that uh, are members of this region where you need to move water uh, resources in the cross-county uh, setting to form uh, that entity by themselves. You have to think about, uh, you know, uh, how they would uh, establish it. But you might also pass legislation 
Uh, and then you, you have to think about whether this would be legislation in the national parliament, or it would be legislation in the county assemblies, or it would be legislation in both the national parliament and county assemblies. Uh, and so these are unresolved questions. Then you go on to how would you finance it? Would each county contribute a bit of money and the national government contributes a bit of money? How would decision making within that setup be uh, you know, uh, organized and brokered? Would you have somebody like the national government with veto power? Would it be based on the level of financial contribution? Would it be level based on the level of demand for water in that particular area? All of these are questions which is resolved would mean that you know, we will be breaking new ground. Uh, and so the establishment of joint authorities in the water sector would actually take devolution in Kenya to a new level and might provide examples for how devolution could be done in other sectors, for instance, in agriculture, in everywhere where you need to find uh, regional you know, cooperation among a number of counties. But dealing with the question of major infrastructure for bulk water supply across counties is not really the complete answer to the question of universal access to water services in Kenya. Article 43, and so we could look at the next slide, Article 43 uh, of the Constitution uh, gives every person in Kenya a right to clean uh, water in adequate quantities. Uh, you know, currently, uh, well over half of the, the country uh, is not uh, properly served with, with water services. In fact, if you look at the combination of rural areas and you know, unplanned uh, settlements within urban areas, then well up to 60% uh, of um, you know, the citizens of Kenya are underserved in terms of clean water in, in adequate quantities. And so even if you were to solve this question of cross-county bulk water supply, you would not solve the question of universal access unless you look also at the provision of water services in rural settings and in unplanned uh, urban areas. To do that, you, you then have to look at what Kenya's policy is and, and how the Water Act of 2016 has dealt with this issue. Basically, it's dealt with as a county government function and the act leaves it to county governments to put in place the necessary policy and institutional and legal frameworks for dealing with rural water supply as well as inset urban areas water supply. These are areas where it's not financially profitable for any uh, you know, uh, county urban uh, water system to, to concentrate. And so there is need for subsidies and for additional uh, financing. At the moment, there is, uh, there is a lack of a clear framework, either in terms of policy uh, or in terms of uh, the law to, to address this particular question. There are many small community groups that uh, cope, uh, provide uh, water services slightly as a coping mechanism. There are many vendors, uh, small you know, vendors who distribute water at uh, quite exorbitant rates. Uh, many of them are regulated. There are a few water service providers who do so on a private sector uh, you know, basis. And uh, you know, all of these options exist, but largely in the absence of a clear uh, institutional framework and in the absence of a clear strategy framework. What would be required, of course, is to find frameworks that can allow for targeted provision of subsidies. But again, uh, given that uh, you know, the current financial management rules in Kenya uh, operate on the basis of you know, county governments financing public entities, county entities like county water services providers, it's not very clear how they are to provide water services, either to support private sector provision of water services by sort of you know, supplementing uh, the cost or to support community groups or indeed uh, to, to support, uh, you know, some um, uh, of these uh, vendors who, who provide water services. One option, and this takes us back to the entity that I mentioned, we do have a water sector trust fund uh, established at national level, whose mandate is to supplement the provision of water services in these underserved areas, but it's a national level entity. And many county governments worry that if you concentrate financial support 
for rural areas and underserved areas at national government level, you are rolling back on devolution. And so a number of county governments have toyed with the idea of establishing their own water sector trust funds. But uh, the idea of having 47 or so water sector trust funds with the overhead costs associated with it is also not an attractive proposition. So another area, as you can see, that uh, requires addressing in order to complete this journey towards devolution would clearly be you know, in, in, in rural areas and, uh, and planned settlements where there isn't you know, piped uh, water services and where the frameworks are not, not very clear. And this is the area where county government legislation is sorely needed. I'd like to conclude where I have discussed essentially some of the key issues that I see as uh, needing to be resolved in order to allow Kenya complete this move uh, to devolution uh, using water services as the case study. But I believe that many of these questions will be reflected uh, in the discussions that are uh, ongoing in other sectors as well. Uh, so I, I'm happy to bring my uh, intervention to an end and, and Jan, I would like to thank you and uh, open up uh, to any questions that may be there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk, Professor Muma. Um, the metaphor of the 